Hey everybody, welcome back to Anderton's TV. I've got an amazing guest today. Uh, someone who has toured and played on records with, you know, so many of my favorite uh, artists. I've discovered one of the most amazing gigs I ever went to. Phil was on stage at the time. So Phil Palmer, everybody, welcome to Anderton's. Hi, hi um, everybody. Yes, you're looking ever so well. I'm guessing the Italian sunshine agrees with you. It does, yeah. I mean, it got a bit hot this summer because uh, in Rome it got to 42 at some points. Um, but it's nice to be back in a moderate climate in a bit of peace and quiet. Oh, well, look, that's nice. Um, OK, so let's dive in. The potted history, for people that aren't familiar with you, are you have two exceptionally famous uncles who introduced you to the electric guitar. Yeah. And you've gone to have a lunatically successful career through, you know, my favourite probably decade of music. You know, that, that I think that last decade of super groups and crazy production albums. Um, but can we take us back? I've also been told, by the way, that Phil's very modest and... Uh, I'm, we, you know, we, I'm, I know most of the artists I think you've played of, but maybe not all of them. So please feel free to, you know, blow your own trumpet a bit during this interview. OK. <laughs> but yeah, so take us back then. Tell, who, tell the people who, who, who are your famous family members and, and what was that like growing up around them? OK, yes. Ray and Dave Davis, uncles, uh, my mother's brothers. Uh, I grew up obviously with them and um, we actually the, our age differences were not that huge. Uh, I think Ray is only 74 now, 75 and I'm 69. Right. So um, yeah I mean I was following them growing up. I was watching them as uh, as they evolved into the kinks. They were originally called the Ravens. Okay. And I remember going to see them at a place called the Athenaeum in Muswell Hill when I was about eight, nine probably. And um, it was, I thought this this is very exciting rock and roll. I, I want to be part of this. And I, I think the whole music thing was, uh, was born for me there. I mean, uh, it was early days of um, technology uh, with, with records. We used to play 78s uh, on my grandmother's gramophone in the, her front room every Saturday. And I used to watch these things whizzing around and listen to, you know, the Everly Brothers on 78 and uh, Eddie Cochran and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, all this amazing stuff, all this information was coming into me. And the, the Kinks uh, evolved into the Kinks about 1962. And uh, I was 10 and they started to have some success. And uh, I used to watch them go up up the motorway in their old Thames van with all the equipment in the back and I thought this is this is the life for me and I think I was sold on it right then. I mean I you know you my dad is same age as I guess Ray is and I kind of feel like what a magical time that must have been to go from that real first wave of British pop I suppose you know pop yeah. rock kind of stuff and the kinks were just you know pioneers I suppose of that whole scene so so was that your you know was that your first introduction to the guitar did they did, were they literally sort of you know I'll give you a few lessons Phil or were you interested anyway no it was my uncle Mike right who taught all of us actually he taught oh, me wow. and Dave and me um, <laughs> and he was a Chet Atkins fan and um, it, it's been very interesting, you know, researching for the book that we'll talk about later, how many people were influenced by Chet Atkins at that time, yeah. in that, it was during the 50s. And uh, so Uncle Mike was the, uh, the teacher for all of us, and we, we learned little, little Chet Atkins pieces when I was a kid. And then I started to get interested in, in the blues thing, and I, I remember listening to Big Bill Brunsey when I was very young. And, finding a piece of film, I think I saw it on TV or something, of him performing in a nightclub in um, in Paris, I think it was, and just being fascinated by his technique, which I'm still trying to perfect. I mean, I've been working on it ever since then. And it's particular. It's, um, the guys that were playing guitar around then, like Chet Atkins and like Bill Brunsey, had a technique where they it was like... Uh, 
a one man band in a way. They had they had a rhythm going, they had they were playing the bass line and they were playing a top line all at the same time. And I thought, that's really difficult. Yeah. And it is really difficult. Yeah. But uh, both of them, Chet Atkins and Big Bull Brunzi, had that technique of uh, sounding like it was a band playing, you know. And I, I think that's what fascinated me. What were your, what kind of kit did you have back then to, to play on? Because this is presumably pre the sense that, you know, Fender or anything like that was available in the shops. Would you, do you, did you have we, like classic old catalogue type guitars that would have been available over here? Uh, I think I had a Vox okay. Phantom, which was a present from Dave. Yeah. Which is shaped a bit like a 50 pence piece. Yeah. Which got lost somewhere along the way, which I still <laughs> had it because it was, it wasn't a great guitar to play on, but it was a, sp a sp special thing. Yeah. Um, and I had an Echo. Uh, acoustic 12 string which uh, is what I pretty much learnt on from the age of about six or seven. Oh, so you you were a young starter then because I, w I was trying to gauge kind of you know were you so so yes introduction to guitar from from a really young age ukulele right. when I was five I got a ukulele Brilliant. my mum bought me a ukulele when I was five and I learnt little brown jug from a little book that came with it three chords and um, mum was very proud <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, I think it. I mean, it's. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I don't want to go all sort of nostalgic and just sort of say, you know, how m much. Not necessarily easier it is to to learn to play now, but you know, the the idea of you know you're on YouTube and you just go, I want to learn to play guitar, and ten million people will go, here's some great free content. You know, like you say, I had a, a, a ukulele, a book. I mean, I, I remember Bert Whedon's playing a day. You know, that was my sort not of introduction. True. Huh? It's not true. What you can't play in a day. <laughs> yeah, no, we, you definitely find that at the end of the first day. Um, but, and I know my granddad knew Bert, and it was, but anyway, actually, in fairness, I'm probably not quite that old. <laughs> but, in, you know, that, that sense of that was how you learned, wasn't it? You got, you, you, you got a, probably a pretty crappy guitar and a, and, a, and a book that was written by someone that was probably 50 years older than you at the time, and yep. off you go. That's but, pretty much it, yeah. So let's talk about then through, through the teens. Are you so? Are you in London at the time? Then is this where you're growing up? Sorry, Muswell Hill, Hill, yeah. yeah so Kings. pretty amazing scene at that time. When were you? Did you have the right haircut and everything at school? And you're thinking, this is me. I'm going to be the next. Yeah, I was not John a Lennon, not a George Harrison student. Uh, my my headmaster used to used to shout at me for having long hair and flared trousers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean. I, it was it was a revolution really going on, and um, I got swept up in it along with my friend Brian, and we uh, Brian was my kind of uh, competition, and we both right. learnt together, and uh, we would challenge each other by finding new things to play, like David Graham, and you know some. I'm, w I'm waiting for you to clang Brian's surname as to be sort of like, are we talking? No. Nope, no, okay, he, it's he, not. <laughs> he, he was a purist, Brian, and he never, he never developed into anything. He didn't want to do it professionally, and I did. That was a difference. Well, so that's okay. Let's, what is that? What's, what's in the, your you know, DNA and your psyche that just went, okay? Because I can imagine as well at that time, I certainly, you know, I, I remember my, you know, my dad who, was professional drummer for a short period of time, but but really not in the style that his dad wanted him to. You know, there was a real sense of, you know, the music at the time was quite rebellious and uh, not necessarily as accepted as maybe it is now. So were you were you did you feel that in society in terms of or or I mean the fact that your mum's two brothers were, you know, it's like rock and roll sort of. Uh, kings you know was was it was there a sense that your family was very open to you being a professional musician my dad was not too keen on the idea my dad was a policeman and um he uh, he was quite anti and he'd, he'd seen what what was evolving you know with the drug scene in in, in the early 60s uh, with the kinks and, and stuff so he'd seen the the bad side of it and he was quite um worried that i might get swept up in that which i must say i never did but I never did, probably because of him. Mm. You know, he was always in the back of my mind saying, you don't want to do this stuff. And so it was a, it was a pretty, um, pretty nervous adolescence in, in a way, because I was always kept, uh, watching uh, for, the, for the old man. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, by the time I was 16 or 17, I was already 
uh, in little bands and, and running around and doing stuff. And I remember a confrontation with Dad when I came home at six o'clock in the morning, just as he was going to work. And uh, he said, listen, uh, you, you've got to give up this pop lark uh, or you'd have to find somewhere else to live. And it, it was okay, a, heavy. <laughs> it was a little heavy, yeah. And so I did. I, I moved out when I was... I was going to say, yes, found somewhere to live as opposed to gave up the pot. Oh, yeah, lark. there was no competition oh, there. Did you, did you reconcile that with him at some point? It took a while. But there's a lovely story in the book, actually, because, um, yeah, he, we kind of fell, drifted apart for a long time, 20 years probably. But then there came a, a moment where I thought, well, this is probably the right time to try to get back together with Dad. And it was um, one of the orchestral nights with Eric Clapton at the Albert Hall. And I thought, well, this is a good moment and, uh, you know, it won't be too loud and it won't be, you know. So I sent a big black car for them and uh, they, they arrived and they got looked after and put in a box with a bottle of champagne and I could see them as as we were doing the gig, and uh, it's very emotional. Oh, I bet. That's why I'm, I'm so pleased that, you know, it's important to try and, every family goes through ups and downs, doesn't it? And I think it's important to make sure you try and put, put as many of those to bed as you possibly can, so I'm happy for you. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, uh, you know, your, your career that at least I know of was um, playing in other people's bands, but how much time were you trying to do your own band thing, mm. and how has that sort of, how have you balanced that through your life in terms of balancing what you do personally with what you might, you know, play with other musicians with? I, I think I always consciously avoided, you know, giving that sort of attention to my own career. I was very happy just, you know, joining bands and, 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 and touring the world and, and doing that stuff. It, it took the pressure off me a little bit. You know, as a session player, you you move from one thing to another daily. I mean, in the early days of sessions, I could do three different sessions in one day. Yeah, there were three hours, you know. And so you 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 know you'd do the jingle session in the morning, something around lunchtime, and something in the evening. And three different studios with three different artists. So I kind of like that diversity, and I like the uh, the the challenge of of you know walking into a room of strangers and and playing a piece of music and making it work, you know. Was there, were you, how did you get that break? I mean, were you, were you I, know, I know there's stories I've read back then that, that there probably weren't that many guys on the session scene then, but you, you had to have had a break at some point. So what, yeah. what was the break? The break, well, there was a few session guitar players around. Uh, Big Jim Sullivan was oh, one. I love Big Jim. He was doing a lot of stuff back yeah. then, you know. Um, that was probably before, but, because I know when I've met, I know Jim, passed away a few years ago now, didn't he? But I remember Jim telling stories of, in his day, it was either him or Jimmy Page. And they were the only two guys that there was. So I'm guessing you you must have come along maybe sort it's of... Just slightly towards, after that, yeah. yeah. Now, I got uh, involved in sessions because Uncle Ray opened a studio in 1970, I think it was, somewhere around there, called Conk, Conk mm -hmm. Studios. And uh, they developed a little label also called Conk Records, and they had a few artists which they signed up to do albums and um, Ray would normally produce and uh, one of the first was a lady called Claire Hamill from County Durham, a lovely girl, great singer, good songs and um, I used to sit at the back in the corner of the, of the control room and watch it happen, fascinated by the procedure and uh, some great players uh, showed up on that, it was Phil, Philip Chen was on bass and, and Clem Coutini I think was oh, the yeah. drummer. Uh, the keyboard player, I can't remember. Tim Hinckley, maybe. Right. Anyway, it was a, a nice bunch of good good players, and I watched them, you know, develop ideas and songs in the studio. And I thought, this is this is amazing. And I got to know Philip Chen very well, and um, he gave me some advice. Um, and one day when they were out at dinner, I um, I was noodling. <laughs> in, in the studio, because uh, Ray had a beautiful old Sunburst Telecaster, I think it must have been a late 50s Telecaster with a white beading around the edge. And I loved that guitar. And I was noodling in the studio just while they were out at dinner. 
And uh, without me knowing, Claire had come back early and she was sitting in the control room listening to me play. And she said, you can play a bit. I said, I'm not doing my best. And she said, can you play on our next track? We need a guitar part now. So Brilliant. she said, develop a part and um, get comfortable with it. And, um, and that was the first session I ever did. So that had been about 73, I guess, 74. And, that, and then, so that was in Ray's studio. And, and that was, was there a light bulb moment? Were you, were you trying to balance a normal job with that at the time? Or were you already you no, know, I, able to be full time? I reluctantly took a job because uh, hmm. yeah, Dad was nagging me. <laughs> and I, I, I worked in a, a little factory in Collindale called Romac. Um, and it was they made rubber products, um, products for the car car trade. And so I was doing that, and I was doing gigs in the evening and um, running around doing all kinds of stuff. But it didn't last very long. The job, yeah. Well, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. So this was early seventies. Now I guess I kind of I can I think I kind of pick up your career probably. 80s so can we fill in the sort of the, the that sort of 70s the rest of the 70s in terms of you know what, what you were doing and and it seems for me you know it's a it's a big old leap to go from being asked to play you know a guitar part on that first uh, session you were saying with it with an artist that I don't suppose many people will be familiar with mm. to some of the names that that you know you're playing with not long after that so what was that sort of you know mid to late 70s in your career it was all sessions basically right. uh, occasional gigs i mean i think i went on the road with claire hamill for a little while with that same bunch of guys and it was good grounding you know because they were great players and um you know to understanding how to do a gig yes. you know f sort of some kind of rapport with the audience and the other members of the band and learning how to uh, to feel comfortable with it and it's, it's something that um i'm very grateful for because uh you know kids today a young musician today doesn't have that you know you can't you can't play at the pub anymore you know like we did you know yeah. there was a pub circuit there was sessions there was you know interaction and i feel sorry for the young players that can't find you know someone to bounce off it it moves on, doesn't it? I think you're right that, you know, I, I, I meet some insanely talented guitar players who've got incredibly good at playing behind their video camera so exactly. they can make videos for YouTube and might be in this environment here. And there might be a bit where you go, shall we? And it's like, no, 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 I'm not jamming. It's like, what, what do you mean you're not jamming? It's just like, I don't jam. It's like that's kind of a, it's sad, really, isn't it? Because it it's is. sort of yes. isn't that the it's sort of huge like part half of the joy, isn't it? But you know, one of the things I, I say to young guitar players, you know, I, I do a few kind of university things, music schools and stuff in Italy a lot. Is uh, okay, pick up a guitar and play me four inversions of C major, because that for me mm. is is much more important than being able to you know, fly around the fretboard. You know, you you you. You are from the school of working guitar players where it's chords for do, solos for show, right? Kind of, <laughs> I suppose. Is it true? I don't know. You, I, I mean, I've oversimplified that, but being able to sit in a band, in a pocket, you know, play to the song is so much more important than being able to do flash yeah I so. mean it's something you, you can't learn sitting at home in front of your, mm. your TV I don't think not successfully anyway you need to be in a room with other musicians and, and understand you know groove and uh, yeah. and taste you know not, not a lot of younger there's some as you say there's some amazing young players out there but it's about taste it's about the notes you don't play sometimes who's it said um, beautiful quote uh, Claude Debussy right. said something 200 years ago, whatever he said, music is the space between the notes. And I think that is so true. I think and the older I get and the more experienced I get at playing, is it's you know, to find one note that will go through three chord changes is much more important to me than trying to join them all together. Yeah. 
Uh, well, there'll be, a, there'll be a ton of people watching this that will resonate with that. Um, come on, I feel like I need to get my virtual, you know, name drop horn out here because we're going to go into the 80s now. And I know you're not going to want to do this because I know how modest you are, but come on. I mean, A, what was the first crazy big one? What was the first one where you went to the studio with butterflies thinking, what the hell am I doing here? You know, it was such a, a gradual curve. I don't think I ever, really? got, I ever got nervous, no. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the first major artist that I worked with was David Essex. Okay. And that would have been in the sub, uh, mid 70s. Uh, and we did uh, a few albums and uh, a couple of world tours. And uh, I liked David, he was a lovely boy. And still is, probably. Yeah. Um, and there's a nice story because, you know, uh, it was a session band, really. I mean, there was a guy called Barry D'Souza was the drummer. It was, a you know, the session drummer at the time. Mike Thorne was the bass player, same deal. Who else was there? Alan Wakeman, sax player. Uh, and, you know, it was, a, it was he, David kept us on a retainer, mm -hmm. you know, which was, I don't know, 30 quid a week or something <laughs> silly. But... Um, it was about the time I'd met my first wife and uh, before we were married and I was looking for my first flat. I was trying to buy my first flat. And I was, I was chatting to um, David's secretary at the time. It was a lovely lady, long-suffering lady called Madge. And she used to run his office for him. And uh, I was down in the office one afternoon and I said, I'm looking, I'm trying to get uh, this new flat I've just found. It's all very exciting and then I'm going to get married and stuff like that. And I said, I've just got to find 1,200 quid for the deposit. She said, oh yeah, it's tough. So anyway, the uh, <clears throat> phone rang the next morning. It was David. He said, I, oh, you need 1,250 quid, right? And he said, there's a check at the office waiting for you. And I said, that's amazing. It's such a nice thing to do. Yeah, thank you, David. <laughs> and he didn't have to do it. And he said, just pay me back out of your, you know, the gig fees for the next whatever. 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, and uh, the first person that came to visit us was, um, was David. And we had a, far too much wine and he fell asleep on my couch and stayed the night. And uh, it was a, just a lovely memory of uh, the uh, early days and uh, how friendly it all was back yeah. then, you know? Well, he's, he was a superstar, wasn't he? You he know, was, at that, yeah. that stage. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, where, where next? What was the? Because it's. I mean, yeah. shall, I, shall I? Do we go Dire Straits or do we go no, well, it's, George it's, Michael it's or a, do we go? It's a bit of a jump yet. Yeah. Um, I think the first kind of serious uh, thing I did was Joan Armour Trading, which would have been around 1980. Who lives up? up I was literally about to say, Joan. I see Joan in Anderton's quite a lot, and I'm always slightly embarrassed. That I'm the only member of staff that actually knows who she is. You know, it's that, I think it's this generational thing like that. But she never, you know, there's never a sense of don't you know who I am or anything like that. You know, so she's, yeah, she's a very, very laid back lady. Yeah. She's lovely. And that's that. I think that was probably the first kind of high profile I did. It was it was about a musical band, mm. and she was very musical, and uh, it wasn't pop anymore. No. It was, you know, it was a little bit more. Uh, deep than uh, mm. uh, working with David Essex, but so that was 80, 81, 82 and we did uh, we did an album called To the Limit, which was quite a big album for her, which was produced by Glyn Johns, who at the time was probably the biggest producer in, on the planet. You know, he's he'd done the Eagles and Zeppelin <laughs> and all kinds of people, and it was. I think I was probably more nervous about working for him right. than anybody prior to that. So. Um, Apart from maybe Frank Zappa, which was a little bit uh, stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Kalang! <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, it's getting good now, isn't it? Basically, because it's where it's just it's just going to be a clang fest. So come on. So Joan, and then and then where? Where are we going? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, that evolved. Um, we did a, a world tour with Joan in 1982 called the Key. To her, and uh, then I went back to sessions and I started doing. Let me see, is it chronologically? It's hard to remember, but you know, 
as you're doing these things, and it's your job. You, you, you go and you walk into a session and it goes flying by and you forget about it, you know. And it wasn't until I started writing the book that I started to realise just how much I've been doing, you know. And um, so, yeah, I think maybe David Sylvian would have been about then. I did, I'm not sure, even sure I know the name. What was David it? Sylvian? Oh, what was he? Very important. Sort Pop of. sing? I don't know. He was in a band called Japan. Oh, OK. Well, I know Japan. And David Sylvian went solo and did some really amazing albums. Oh. And they're really worth a listen. Anybody out there is, is into something a bit odd. Like the Japan stuff? or No, so it, was, like, it was like David Sylvian. It was particular. And he worked with a, a chap called uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto, oh. who was uh, a bit of a genius, uh, obviously Japanese, but uh, um, uh, just a, a really interesting uh, combination of... Um, of influences, both of them together was a bit electric. Oh, I, f I missed out David Bowie. <laughs> Sorry. Hang on. I don't think the horn's big enough anymore. <laughs> um, what? So what, sessions on a Bowie album? No, on, on an Iggy Pop album with, da with David, David producing. <laughs> I mean, it was like that. I mean, uh, you you get a call and you say, OK, I'll be there, you know, and, and you'd walk into the room and there would be whoever it was. And you didn't get any butterflies? No. Wow. Well, yeah. I got butterflies just doing this interview. <laughs> I'm just asking the questions. <laughs> the, the Zappa moment was quite interesting. Come because, on. Because nobody knew he was going to be there. But um, it was uh, it came through a, a very good friend of mine, a lovely bass player called Dave Marquis. Right. And uh, Simon Phillips was there as well, and a keyboard player called Jeremy James Lasalles, I think. And we walked into AdVision Studios at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning in the centre of London, it was raining, uh, to do a session for a, an Indian violin player called El Shankar. Okay. Right. And um, at the desk was, was Frank Zappa, you know, and <laughs> everyone went, that's King Frank Zappa, <laughs> you know, because his, um, you know, his reputation was the mother's of invention, very difficult and mm. complicated music. And we all went, oh God, you know, we're a bunch of London session players, you know, we're not going to get into that. But it was actually very nice and he was very nice. And um, we did a couple of very strange tracks on that album. Um, one which I might try and play in a minute because it's... Uh, it was so complex, the piece. Uh, El Shankar, as his name suggests, was Indian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd written this piece called Darlene, uh, which is based on an Indian raga kind of thing. And it had, the time signature was insane. You know, it was based on a 5-8 pulse, but it would go into 4-4 four, four occasionally, you know, 6-8, then a 11-16 bar popped up. And um, we all struggled with it a lot you know it was i'm sure i've seen a like a an old bbc ravi shankar interview where he talks about indian music and it is the time it's that you almost can't write down the time signatures it's, a, it's a sort of a now simon, a simon flow of some sort and, that's right yeah yeah you have to you have to kind of feel it you, yeah you can't write it down. It's, it's all happening too quick to mm. to read or even write down. And Simon Phillips was a, a proper reader, mm. and he couldn't he couldn't figure it out. So we all sat in a corner in in the studio in a circle, clapping like this. And and El Shankar was doing this sort of dun da 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 to give us the sort of some groove. sense of rhythm. Yeah. yeah. And after a few hours, or probably a whole day actually, we we figured out okay, that's where the that's where the that's where the, things happen and there's a push there and there's this there and you had to physically get to, to know the song. Of all the music I thought you'd be playing in this interview, I wasn't thinking it would be a sort of a piece of music that you played with a, an Indian violinist, but hey. I, I, doubt, <laughs> I doubt if I can still play it, but it, it was so complicated that, uh, let's see.
something like that. Well, I mean, bear, bearing in mind you just literally pulled that out from 30 odd years ago or more than that, uh, I'm impressed. It was um, one of those things that, you know, it, it just stayed in there because we had to, we did probably 70 takes wow. to get it right. And it, but it's anybody interested out there, it's a fabulous little piece of music. Uh, it's called Darlene by El Shanker, and it's from an album called Touch Me There, I think. Oh, there we go. So come on then. So that was that's Frank. That was the Frank Zappa kind of moment. That where where are we off to now? And what where are we? Mid eighties now? You reckon? Um, probably about eighty, nineteen eighty. Yeah. Oh, okay, early eighties still then. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. I did, I've done a session for, oh, what's his name? Good Earth Studios. Who used to own Good Earth Studios in London? I can't remember his name. Very famous producer. For Ralph McTell. Right. It's just one of those, you know, afternoon sessions yep. that I, I've just done. And obviously this guy had connections with, with David Bowie. Gosh, what's his name? He's very famous. I'm rubbish at producers, so apologies. I can't help you here. Um... Okay, so uh, somehow my name got to David Bowie, who was in Berlin producing an album with Iggy Pop, and it became known as The Idiot, and it was a bit of a milestone album. Mm -hmm. There's some great tracks on it. The, the original China Girl was on there. Right. The original of that. And another track called Night Clubbing, which got covered by a few people later on. And um, I, I was still at home, okay, so... Um, it was four o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, and my mum got to the phone before I did, right, and she came up the stairs and said, Philip, there's a Mr. Bowie on the phone for you. And I was convinced that it was one of my mates wind up, yeah. messing around, yeah. Uh, and it was him. And he said, uh, we'd like you to come to, uh, to Germany to play on this album. I said, OK. <laughs> Fine, and uh, I just took this. I just took this Telecaster with me. No caster, sorry. And um, I got on the plane uh, two days later, and uh, I spent a week in uh, in Munich because they did, they'd moved to studios by that point uh, with David Bowie and Iggy Pop, which was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> was are they? I say they. I mean, it, is Iggy as large? Is he as large as life when you're in... That's what you see is what yeah, he's like, is it? Absolutely, yeah. Wow. There was an electricity between the two of them, which yeah. was just scary. You know, they used to wind each other up and they used to try things out. And, you know, if you were in the middle of it, it was a difficult place to be. But uh, it was a fascinating energy they had together. Oh, it's, just, I'm, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, I th in the interest of just trying to sort of get to the current day we are going to have to move on in sense of just keep going through sure, your, yeah. all your artists and stuff like that. but i tell you what we'll talk about that in a minute but you know you can get the extended version of this interview i suggest <laughs> in, in, in the book <laughs> um so where where are we going now then all right yeah that would have been after joan i went back into the session world and i was probably doing i don't know i did some tears for fears i did some uh howard jones maybe is a bit early I did uh, some Christa Berg. Now, Christa Berg was a... Bit of Lady in Red. Yeah, I did Lady in Red. That's me. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> How long was that number one for as well? I yeah, mean, that, did now well. you're getting into the bit where I, you know, songs from the big chair, didn't everybody of my age and probably, you know, had that album. Probably, you know, one of the albums of the 80s. Yeah, I think it is the album yeah. of the 80s. You, you're you're on... Friend. Like you, you play on Lady in Red, do you? I do. Every, you know, for, for decades, the first <laughs> dance at every wedding that there was. <laughs> that was my Amazing. idea. Yeah. I'd been listening, on the way down to the studio that day, I'd been listening to uh, Marvin Gaye. I came on the radio, I thought, Sexual Healing. Oh, I thought, well, this is such a great track. And I think I was still thinking of it. I got in the studio and they said, we got this tune and we think it's uh, it might be finished but if you've got any ideas bung them on i need a plectrum i don't think i've got one. Oh, hang on i might have some oh i've got one. Oh, well done and so i started playing this little little noodly thing something like that and uh, they said oh we like that put that on track it up and uh <laughs> that became the lady in red <laughs> 
That's nuts. <laughs> that is nuts. What I mean, uh, and then okay, just I can't keep going. I mean, it's right, nuts yeah. as well, and it just gets bigger as well, or at least kind of, I think it does. But okay, there's an important moment happened. Uh, I think around eighty four, eighty five, and I, I met and started working with a guy called Paul Brady. And uh, Paul Brady was a fabulous Irish singer songwriter. Uh, and we, we got on really well and we did a couple of really nice albums and we, a couple of really good tours around Europe and um, you know, there's footage online of Rock Palace and, and things like that, the German TV show with us playing. Very young, very uh, kind of a lot of energy and uh, Brady was amazing. And um, I suppose towards the end of the 80s, the middle, middle to end of 80s, uh, we'd, we'd done quite a lot of work and we were playing at a club called The Mean Fiddler yeah. in Harlesden in London and uh, it was a, a, a rare London gig for, for Brady. We had done all the provinces, we'd done Ireland, we'd done Germany, etc. And Brady was a bit nervous about playing in London and um, consequently he was, he was kind of pushing the tempos up and stuff like that. And I'm playing away, I think I'm playing this. And I looked up and is Eric Clapton in the audience, right? And, I, and my fingers turned into bananas, basically. <laughs> I couldn't play. Because, yeah, you know, so many of my influence had been from him and, and you know, a lot of the licks that I, I play still was stolen from him. I mean, it's all relative and he's probably stolen from someone else, but that's beside the point. And so I, I felt very uncomfortable, and he's standing there, and I thought, I can't, I can't look at him. But anyway, he came backstage after the show and said hello to everybody. And it turned out that Brady had asked uh, Eric to play on one of his tracks that he was recording, and, and he just popped along to say hi. It's a track called Deep In Your Heart, which was a really nice tune. And um, so Eric did that, and um, literally, it had been a good year, and so literally, me and my wife and my... Uh, Oliver wasn't born then, was he? Yes, he was, born in 84. Uh, we went to Antigua for a holiday at Christmas. Yeah, it had been a good year, we'd made a few bob yeah. and stuff. And um, we, I'm sitting on the porch of this little beach hut thing that we were renting, and walking up through the haze, <laughs> I, on, in Antigua on the beach, I saw Eric Clapton <laughs> again. And uh, he had this beautiful young lady on his arm. And um, I thought, I, I don't know what to say. And he walked right past the front of me and he, and he looked at me and he said, you're Phil Palmer, aren't you? <laughs> Which was, you know, <laughs> a, a surprise. And I said, yeah, come in for a cup of tea. And he did, and we got chatting. And he said, um, after a few you know, chats about music and, uh, and influences and stuff. He said, I'm, I'm starting to put an album together. And after Christmas, I'm going to be going into the studio. And could you pop along? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. And that became the Journeyman album. I was thinking, is that, yeah, as everyone will know who watches this, my all time, possibly all time favorite album of all time. Certainly my favorite Eric Clapton album. Yeah, mine too. Actually, um, it's a great album. And so I arrived at the Townhouse studio again uh, you know, when I got back and uh, there was Phil Collins on drums, Pino Palladino on bass and Alan Clark on, on Hammond. And we put that track, we put a couple of tracks together. But, uh, Which ones are you on then? I was on um, Bad Love. Oh man. That. And that was that recorded in Antigua? No, it was recorded in London at the right. townhouse. Sorry, you said, yeah. Um, I, was, I just had no... I, I, I've got to hold it together here and try and carry on some sort of... And, and you, still no butterflies then? You're just, it's all in your stride at this point, uh, is it? Yeah, just, I'd, I'm I'd, Phil Palmer and I'd, I'm... I'd known Pino for a while already by then. And uh, yeah, he was a friendly face and I knew Alan as well. 
I, I think my first meeting with Phil Collins, but um, it was very relaxed, very nice. You know, we we did a track and all went for lunch and uh, uh, it all got on really well. Uh, I mean, yeah, that that's that. Yeah, I mean, for me, that that kind of those three albums. I think the 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 one with um, Forever Man on it, which was the one before, wasn't it? Then then uh, or, or August as well and Journeyman. Yeah. That 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 trilogy of of albums is just again defined the sound. I think of a of a of a you know of a decade. It was fantastic. And I think, in a way, that was just Eric checking that you know, he didn't need me there, really. But I think he wanted to check that I was able to uh, to you know, put it together in, in the right way. And um, then he asked me to go on the tour. And that would have been a big tour. It was a huge tour, yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is that kind of... Yeah, it, it's that... For me, it was the heyday of just the amount of money that artists or record companies would throw at albums and tours. Yeah. And it, the scale of it was just, it's hard to see. I, I maybe, maybe I'm, maybe tours still some, you know, there's so much money, I suppose, but it's still involved in, in touring, so the scale of them. But it, I just, I just feel like the 80, you know, that, that that sense of it was okay to spend six months or a year or two years in some cases, you know, recording an album in the most expensive studio there was with the most expensive session players there was. And it just doesn't happen anymore. No, um, it doesn't. And absolutely. hasn't probably since the 80s. Uh, it, was, it was still going on in through the 90s, but uh, yeah, as technology uh, started to uh, take over, it was, uh, those events well, st stopped happening. So how did this... Um, bef before we started filming, I was saying to Phil that, 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 you know, it was kind of freaky because one of the first big gigs I ever went to, I always say that, I, I say the best gig I ever went to was my dad took me to see uh, Queen in 1986 wow. for, uh, you know, and I, I was 14 years old and it just completely blew my mind. But I think the first gig that I went to, first big gig that I went to probably on my own, I definitely went with a girlfriend, but like, you know, not with my parents, was the Nebworth thing. Yep. So were you, at the time, who whose band were you sort of formally in to that go was, on? That was still Eric's band. So that was still Eric, right. So yeah. this is before the Dire Straits stuff? Yeah, in fact, there was an interesting crossover on that day, but... Um, so for people that don't know, this Nebworth gig, I don't even know if it had ever really happened before... It was for Nordolf Robbins, wasn't it? A big yes. charity thing. Whether it had ever happened before, and I, I, mean, I suppose probably has happened since, but with more, maybe more sort of contemporary pop bands. But this, this was like a whole day of just every massive British band that there was, spanning a, a, a fair, you know, it would go from status quo and Cliff Richard through to Pink Floyd and Dire Straits and Eric Clapton and Genesis and uh, Genesis with the Phil Collins singing and um, Tears for Fears. Um, who else would have played that? God, it, was, it was, and there, were, there must have been 100,000 people, 150,000, I can't remember. It's it was Nebworth lot. Bowl, apps. There's the, the, I, I had the album and it was like a double fold out album with a helicopter shot of the crowd basically. And it's just, I look at is the it in there? The book. It's, it's are you, are you, my, so, I mean, it literally was just, uh, insane. I can literally remember where I was standing. I was, I was standing. Oh, look, there's Frank Zappa. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, no, that's. Not, I don't think the shot that is. Unless this is the one I'm talking about. Oh, there. Well, there you go. Eric Clapton in his pink suit. I remember that. I can't. I cannot believe that that guitar, the red guitar, there yeah, is the guitar that, that you. That freaks me out. Um, and it was just. You it, should show. Yeah. You know. I mean, show it to the camera. I'll, I'll, we'll get, we'll get, a, we'll, we'll, sh we'll find a shot of it and we'll insert so, it in there. I've got the rights to the picture. Okay, okay. we'll find, but it was, it was uh, nuts. And I, I watched the whole gig standing. I was just, the, I remember they had this huge scaffolded kind of, um, you know, place where the, the mixing console was sort of in the middle of the crowd. And mm. we were just to one side of that. And, and it was just. You probably see yourself in that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With the bad haircut from 1990, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, I mean, we have to talk about that day. Um, yeah. But the, the build-up and everything must have been nuts, wasn't it? 
that band, Eric's band was, I think, the best band in the world, um, certainly then. And it was Steve Ferroni and Nathan East and Greg Fillingains and Alan Clark and uh, Ray Cooper. And Katie. Two the percussionists, right? Yeah. 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 I, I can remember, so it's like, wow. It was just a stupendous band and I was very privileged to be part of it. But by the time we'd played uh, Nebworth, we'd been on the road for probably a year. Right. Doing gigs, and I was really relaxed with it all. And it, as I say, it was such a great band to, to play in. And things would happen spontaneously in front of massive audiences. You know, Everybody was that good that they could... Mm. If Eric did something strange and we all followed it, and everybody would pile in. And it was a beautiful, spontaneous organic kind of machine. Well, didn't David Bowie sing at that? Have I got that? Did he do a spot? Was he, he didn't present it, did he? Just something came to me and then just going, I'm sure he was there as well. Because it was, it was that era where everyone just had great suits. Basically, that yeah. was the sort of, I just, there's something, I don't know, I might have got that wrong. It was 30 something years ago, but uh, yeah, yeah, suits, it was a good gig. The suits, Versace suits, yeah. Were they? Yeah. Nice. Free, or do you have to pay no, for it? I had to pay. Mine was three <laughs> three thousand quid. Oh. <laughs> it was very expensive, and I yes. got it in New York. Yeah. Wow. And that was um, so, but that because that although each sort of band did a set as such, the ending of it was everyone, wasn't it, on stage at the same yeah, time? So who things. were you on stage with for that sort of that last? Well, that, that, bit? there's an important moment that happened as, as we spoke about earlier, where. Um, Eric's halfway through Before You Accuse Me, mm -hmm. which is a 12-bar shuffle blues, really, an E. It's not, it's not rocket science, you know, but uh, it was a nice groovy, a nice groove track. And um, he broke a string in the first solo. And um, he got to the second solo and he turned around and he said, take it, Phil. And I you know, spontaneously had to play a solo where I'd never played one before, as I say, it's not, it wasn't rocket science, but uh, it was, it was a, a, an interesting moment, and uh, I remember the thought process was quite, uh, quite clear. The complication at that moment was that um, Eric ran off to find his guitar tech and change guitars, and I looked over to the, my right, and uh, standing there next to, and they were chatting, was Mark Knopfler. All right, so there's there's Mark Knopfler and Eric Clapton chatting at the side of the stage while I'm playing a solo in front of 120,000 people and probably 12 million people watching it on television. And um, I, I got away with it, you know, it was one of those things. I thought, well, if I can do that, I can do pretty much anything, you know. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed the moment. I bet you did. I bet. Can we um, see the guitar? So, yes. This, Let's have a little listen. Come on. This, this, this guy, okay. What's the story? Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd acquired these on on the first tour with Eric um, in America, and I got a green one as well, which is nice. quite a famous one because it's uh, it's the only one of that color. I, a friend asked me what color I wanted. I said British racing green of with <laughs> with gold hardware, and it's um, it's a lovely thing. And I used it with Eric, and then Dire Straits, and uh, my guitar. Tech used to call them port and starboard because uh, obviously they said, What do you want, port or starboard? You know, yeah, red and green. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, this this became my main guitar. Um, I, I liked the uh, the EC strats because of the lace sensors, and um, and you could get this little bit of extra fatness out of the guitar mm. with, with this mid boost thing. I thought that was Clapton's, you know, that dr driven tweed amplifier with the mid boost in. That was such a Clapton signature sound, you know. Yeah, it's, it was, um, yeah. But you sound like you use it less as a drive effect and more as a fattening effect. It's you? a fattening effect more yeah. than anything, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes the, the regular strat is the cleaner sound, like Mark, for example, yeah. is, is a very, very beautiful thing. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'd, I was always a little bit frustrated. I could never get enough drive out of a, out of a regular Strat. So yeah. this this came along and it's it's just changed all that. And I've been playing them ever since, and I use them on everything now. And is, was the red one the the, the go-to one for some reason, or do you, is it sort of fifty-fifty? Uh, yeah, I think the red one has always been my favourite. Mm. Uh, I've got a black one now, which is now my favourite. But uh, it's the same same setup. 
Um, but and this one's this one lives in England, and I've got the green one in um, in Italy and the black one in Italy too. And there's one that lives in France as well. Can we let's hear a little bit with the you know how you might use the mid boost circuit? Okay, that it's, so that's in it. you know just you know really, there's not much drive on the amp here. <laughs> It's quite compressed, but uh, so if you want to suddenly do a, a nice blues solo, Guitar. Yeah, yeah, I, I, could, if I was going to maybe save the question for a bit later in the interview, but as you as you kind of mentioned it, then who of the who of the kind of like the superstar guitar players that you, that you've played and performed with do you think sort of has influenced you the most as a as a player? It's an interesting question. I mean, I was I think I was very influenced by Eric when mm. I was a kid. I remember listening to uh, Cream. Um, and specifically, uh, I found a, a solo that Eric played. I was going to ask you to play something in a minute. Oh, okay. On a song called As long as it doesn't involve four different inversions of a C chord, yeah. <laughs> I should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a song called Badge. You know, remember Badge? Yes. Can you play the riff? Uh, hum it and I'll remember it. That's pretty this much. Where, this is where we need a better guitar player in there, but I'll do my be I'll do my best, and you're just going to a little noodle over the top, are you? Well, the, the solo on that song, the original version of uh, by Cream, I was fascinated by it because it's complex. I mean, Eric's a blues player, but he managed to um, incorporate a kind of a a blues scale in in that major key because it's very major, it's mm -hmm. very you know very happy sort yeah. of sound. And uh, the solo he played on the original, I just, I was in, absolutely, I had to learn it. And I sat down in front of my mum's stereogram with the record, with, you know, and uh, got very good at lifting the stylus and in the <laughs> right place. With my, my echo uh, acoustic, learning that solo. Well, let's, shall we, shall we, shall we try it? And um, the reason it's so, so clever is that he uses a lot of, semitone bends in mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. um i found i found that really challenging i think it is challenging for a lot of guitar players you know we're all used to doing you know yeah but and getting it in tune yeah. Yeah. it's not easy and that i think you hear that straight away with that clapton thing of almost the change in key of the of the song it'll use those semitone bends to to just go from one mood to another in a single Bends. It's, it's very Eric Clapton. It is. Thing. It's one of his tricks, yeah. and uh, but he, he does it beautifully. And so uh, the solo of Badge. Keep going. It's a thing of beauty. Yes. It's a melody within yeah. a melody. You know, it's uh... that. 
you know, I, I think I was in a, you know, I was working in a guitar shop during the late 80s with Eric Clapton being my idol and having to sort of feel like I was constantly defending him against people that were going, oh yeah, but Steve Vai is much better or Joe Satriani is yeah, much better. Well, yeah. And I was sort of a bit like, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> you know, but I'm glad in a way, I think people appreciate him more now for exactly that, that, that sense of melodic yeah. soloing as opposed to just technically complicated soloing. Yeah. You know? And, you know, Eric would never play the same solo twice. <laughs> And you know, we we there was a, a moment in um, South America at the River Plate Stadium, Argentina, in front of I don't know, thirty, eighty thousand people, a lot of people. And um, right before we went on, on we did the sound check, and Eric said, "Does anybody know the song Badge?" Right. right. And we knocked it together real quick, and I said, "Can I do the solo? <laughs> like, can I do the first solo tonight?" And uh, he said, "Yeah, go ahead." And so we got to the um, the first solo, and I played his solo, that one. Yeah. I just played, and um, from the original Cream version. And there was this lovely moment between us. If there's on video somewhere, if you want to, you know, find it, it's uh, where he's just laughing his head off because you know I'm looking at him and he's looking at me, and there's this lovely moment of. Uh, of realization, what I'm up to, you know. That's insane. I, I still think now that the solo off of Bad Love, some of the bends and some of the, you yeah, know, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, like three tones. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, for a few times that I think of come and I'll sit down and learn this. It's just like, I'm there, you know, it's just, it's just a different level, you know. It's, yeah, just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's spontaneous, that's the thing. Right. You know, it's, n it's never worked out. I mean, was that, was that the beauty of being in the studio? It was just, and, and you're just, you know, a few takes and then all of a sudden the magic and that, that's the one. Isn't yeah, it? pretty much, yeah. That's but, on, you know, live, you never hear the same solo twice. And, you know, you had to be on your toes because depending on how he felt, he, he, you know, a solo could last, you know, in minutes rather than bars, you know. You count the minutes and you just go for it. And it well, that's what the audience is there for, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, and, you know, and like... people loved him for that. And sometimes he would, he would fuck up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he just run out of ideas or run out of fretboards sometimes. I do, I do think again. We'll, this is supposed to be about Phil Palmer, not Eric Clapton. But you know, I, I do still kind of feel it's like it's worth taking a dive. You know, for young guitar players now, people will maybe see Eric Clapton and they'll they'll see perhaps the sort of the the, the, the more recent stuff and the, and and much more revisiting of very very traditional blues and maybe it might not be their thing but if you if you look at that sort of 70s and 80s period of him it's just like he was rock and he roll he was on fire yeah on i must fire. say yeah he was um it's, which is nuts anyway anyway come on we we were we were at Nebworth i think oh yeah and then you mentioned Mark Knopfler and so, and I is so. Is that then the uh, was was that was that shortly after that that Mark said, you know, why don't you yeah. come and play with uh, us for a bit? <laughs> pretty much, um, we did a rehearsal for Nebworth, and we we played a few tunes with Mark, and uh, we seemed to hit it off okay. There was a connection anyway, um, because uh, I mentioned Paul Brady mm -hmm. early on, and uh, Paul Brady was the same management as Dire Straits. A guy called Paul Cummings was mm -hmm. the. Um, was the link there so they kind of knew about me anyway but um yeah the Nebworth show we, we decided to amalgamate the two bands and uh, have uh, Mark come on and John Ilsley came on and mm -hmm. Guy Fletcher and we did uh, a few Dire Straits tunes um including Money for Nothing and uh, did we do Sultans I can't remember <laughs> I can't remember but I'm uh, definitely going to try and dig out the double album from somewhere though when I get home and remember it. And there's, there was a track that um, Mark had written for someone else called I, I Think I Love You Too Much, was it a great tune. Uh, and we played that and um, so that was my first time on the stage with, with Mark and, and Dire Straits and Eric all at the same time. And it was a, it was a joyous occasion in many ways. Um, we got on. Um, Mark soon after, I oh know, let me just tell you the story because uh, I think it was important. Uh, after that event, after Nebworth, uh, Eric continued to tour and he was doing great business all around the world. And you know, he was doing two, three nights in the same venues and stuff like that around, mm -hmm. around the world. 
and we were loving it and the band was amazing and then we had two events quite close together which changed everything with Eric and once one was a helicopter crash with uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan um, and the second was his son mm. uh, Connor who uh, f you know, had a terrible accident and uh, I remember going to the funeral in Ripley up the road and a uh, very sad day obviously mm. But um, we had a chat, I had a chat with uh, Roger Forrester, who was Eric's manager at the time. And uh, Roger said, quietly, he said, I, d I don't think Eric's going to be doing anything for a while. Mm. Yeah, so, um, you know, if something comes up, you should probably take it. And he said it to everybody in the band, and everyone went, went home and thought about it. And uh, the first thing that came up was uh, the Dire Straits tour. And... Uh, <coughs> And I, I decided to do it and um, signed a contract to do it. And literally two or three days later, I had a call from Eric saying, I'm not going to sit around doing nothing. I'm going to do an unplugged album. Right. Can you do it? And I had to say no. And it was a tragic day. I, mean, I, I, I tried to get out of the Dire Straits tour, in actual fact, but they wouldn't let me because I'd signed the paper. And so uh, I was kind of tied into Dire Straits for two years, which was, you know. No, who got, because Andy Fairweather Lowe then did all the... Um, yeah, he did it after that. Unplug yeah. thing, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know, that'll be a whole... I think for a generation of people, that'll be what they know Eric for, you know, that much more laid-back, bluesy, acoustic versions of tunes. But, mm -hmm. oh man, I mean, it's just, it's a difficult one, that one, isn't it? To sort of go, it yeah. it's not like... You didn't do that album and <laughs> never worked again. You didn't do that album and did something else amazing. But I know what you mean. It was yeah. a pretty landmark yeah. album, that one, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, you know, what is that, 20 million or something, that album? I, I, don't, I don't know. It was, it was, it was, it was it, that, and, and it was the MTV era as well, wasn't yeah. it? The, of that whole, I think they say that it's that one and the, and the, is it that one and is it the Nirvana appearance on MTV are the two most watched? Mm -hmm. you know things of all time on MTV but um well hey let's talk about let's talk about <laughs> Dire Straits though because I mean hey I mean again crazy super group of a band you know it's just so what was they were huge yeah but um Brothers in Arms was it 30, 32 million yeah. albums and that song Brothers in Arms that's still one of those songs I literally I borderline feel like I want to cry every time I listen to that song. It's such a beautiful... People do in yeah. the audiences. No. It's, it's crazy. Um, but, but yeah, and that was that... I don't know with the... So were you doing studio stuff with, with Dire Straits as well? well a, an interesting thing happened after that because I think Mark did exactly the same thing as, as Eric. He said, he, so he invited me into the uh, studio at Air in mm -hmm. Oxford Street, where it was then. To, uh, to play on a couple of tracks that he was recording for On Every Street. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an interesting day. I, I noticed Jeff Beccaro was there <laughs> on, on the drums that day. And um, you know, some, uh, some, great, some great tracks on that album, some really nice playing. And he had me, um, okay, we had, we had a sort of experiment going. He said he, uh, he wanted to, me to play this little arpeggio part he said it's quite intricate and I want you to be exact right and this this is some kind of uh, audition really you mm. know just I think not not to make sure I could play he knew that already um, but to make sure that I could be precise and to, to follow those kind of orders and uh, we fiddled about with the riff for, I think we played it earlier of um, on every street there's an arpeggio which became a, a big moment in the set and Mark and I would play that riff together in the middle of the stage mm -hmm. with nothing else going on and uh, we had, he had me playing that for probably six hours <laughs> right and then he would say something like, ah, sounds not quite right, let's find another strat. And um, I'd gone through all my strats and um, 
and he started bringing in some of his and he said play it on that one and so I played it on a different strap bigger neck or fatter strings whatever and um, he was recording them all on separate tracks and the engine is going nuts and sort of shaking his head saying what are you doing uh, and so we went through this whole process of uh, me playing that riff all day mm. basically on different strats and in the end we had 16 strats set up around the studio <laughs> and he, he said he said to Ron Eve who was his guitar tech he said go, go down the warehouse and bring the black one and, and you know, let's try that one out and so Ron was running around stringing up guitars and uh, yeah, finding them so we tried all these went through this process and it uh, lasted all day and we got, we got to about um, 10 o'clock at night, I suppose, and uh, he said, uh, we were listening back to them and putting bits together and editing and stuff, and he said, which one do you prefer? I said, I have to be honest, I can't tell anymore. You know, we've been doing this all day. And he said to the engineer, he said, no, nah, I can't tell either. You choose, he said to the engineer, and went home. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And... Um, you know, that was my audition. I, I, I thought you were going to say, because again, when we were chatting before, you were talking about a time when I thought you were going to say they'd used all 16 as like some sort of super multi-tracked no, version no, of exactly. it. But Only one version appeared. Do, do you find, I kind of, I hear a Mark Knopfler influence when you're playing that. It, do you find it's your job as the player, as the session player, to make it sound almost as if Mark Knopfler had played it, so that when someone's listening to the record, they get, they don't go, oh yeah, that's a different guitar player playing that bit. They just assume that Mark's played it all. Or I is must, that... No, I must say Mark never insisted. He showed me a few of his techniques, mm. um, which are quite difficult to learn, but um, he never insisted. In fact, I, I've got this kind of, um, I, I prepare myself when I'm working with someone like Mark, because I, I never play his licks, even mm. if I can. Mm -hmm. You know, in front of him. Mm. I think that would be a wrong thing to do. Same with Eric. I mm. never I never really tried to, you know, unless he specifically said, do that here. But we're, we're you know, I mean, I suppose Mark's, he's more of a finger style guitar player than it, but do but you, you, you know, see, would you... I, that's where I came from anyway. Right. And I, I wasn't influenced by Mark Knopfler. I was influenced by the same mm. people that Mark Knopfler was influenced by. So it's probably the other way around. It's Mark is attracted to work with you because he likes your style rather than you Possibly, going... Possibly, or, or right. under, understood that I was, mm. you know, able to do what he wanted me to do. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, I, this, this guitar influenced the way I play, you know. This is a great interlude. I mean, it's been sitting there. It's been the... Not the elephant in the room is the wrong word, but it's been sitting there quietly... Um, you know, doing, just not saying its thing. We have to talk about this. Okay. I mean, I know it's a, it's a little bit of a detour from where we were going, but there's some history and some... There is. And this was a present. Well, I say present. I mean, back in uh, <coughs> the early 70s, the Kinks were working in America all the time. And uh, it's back in the days where you could find guitars in junk stores. And, you know, people that would... Uh, hocked them or whatever and he came across this one and <clears throat> and he came back with like three or four really great guitars including his original flying v which was i love that guitar gibson flying v uh and um a les paul jr with one pickup which i also love same color and um and he was farting around with them and uh this one was a bit beat up, you know, it's a little bit beat up really. It needed um, some work doing on the on the frets, the frets were worn out. So I had it refretted and he said, well, take that one away, have that one, you know, if you like it. And I did, I loved it, I mean, I fell in love with it. It, it. it changed the way I played this guitar. I mean, this guitar is responsible for my style, if you like, because you can do things with it you can't do with other guitars. I mean, I used to... I used to listen to a guy called Roy Buchanan, do you remember him? All those, bend. that and the behind the, the behind, all that stuff, it's very cool. And um, that's, that was my influence, he was my influence. Roy Buchanan and uh, Scotty Moore, was it? Uh, pickers, you know, country mm, pickers. Mm. Uh, even, even Chet Atkins, as we mm. said earlier, <clears throat> influenced my style a lot. So this guitar really, 
chose me in in a way it's a bit like the um the, the concept of the the harry potter wand <laughs> you know the wand chooses the wizard rather than the other way around you, you are you are impossibly modest because you've managed <laughs> to tell the whole story of this guitar without actually going it's an original 51 no custom it is yeah in, 1951 with all the original bits oh, i would say you changed the pickups but the original pickups are in the case no no i changed the, the volume oh the volume right so that's the all. pickups right so it's, it's just the knobs. it's all original and um apart from that volume pot which became impossible to use because it just you've uh, got you've got the original um bridge cover as yeah, well it's in the case and you, over there. you know you say it's beaten up it's not that beaten up well, not uh, the neck's 70, incredibly good nick 70 years old it's not bad I mean, with the providence behind that, I, I, I know it's you know vulgar to discuss things like that, but that's I mean that's that's possibly one of the most valuable guitars. I mean, it's going to be up there with with I imagine something like you know Bernie Marsden's Les Paul or Peter Green's Les Paul. But yeah, and show the back. Yeah, this on the back is interesting. Um, it, it puzzled me for a long time. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. It says Carl C A R L. And it was obviously put on there a long time ago to protect the varnish or to protect the finish on the back. And I was lucky enough to do a gig with um, Carl Perkins at the Albert Hall. <laughs> and I took this along and I said, um, do you recognise that? He said, God damn. He said, I haven't seen that in a while. So it's probably, it was his at some point. I don't know what, uh, how it found its way into a junk store in New York. But, um, but David bought it in New York and brought it back. And so um, we did a bit of research on it. We had it refretted at Rokers. There's, in the case, there's... Um, Rokers on Denmark Street. Yeah. yeah. Rokers did the refret. And in, in the case somewhere, there's a, there's a receipt for a top nut, £1.75. £1.17 shillings and sixpence, maybe. Wow, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not. I, I, you don't sound like the sort of person that's particularly like its value as a collectible thing doesn't sound like it's terribly important to you. Its value as a tool and as an instrument sounds like it's more important. Which I, half of me feels is just like it's super refreshing because that is what it is. But you must. You're holding in your hands there probably the price of a two-bedroom flat somewhere. <laughs> In Guildford, you know, it's like, it's like that is. It may come to that someday. I don't know, but um, I mean, let's it's, see. It's, it's just, I mean, it is amazing to, and you know, just for the viewers, Pete's played it, and so I'm sure he'll talk about that in a subsequent video and how it compares with his purple one. But I, I think you liked it, right, Pete? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. It is marvelous. It, it affects the way you play. Well, it affected the way I play. Mm. Uh, I really love the story, by the way. I don't know if it's a, a it's a, a myth of any description, but. Uh, Roy Buchanan, who I mentioned earlier, had one very similar to this, except he had a hole drilled through there, and like a quarter inch yeah. hole, quite a big hole, where he used to hang it on a nail. <laughs> he used to hang but, it on a nail in his house. But I, I, and I still love that, because again, I, you know, I mean, this is, my dad started the music store in 64, and I've said, you know, I said, oh, dad, if only you'd kept some of the instruments you'd, and he's just like, well, what were we supposed to feed ourselves with then? You know, it's just like, they were just, they yeah. were just bits of wood that you sold to guitar players to go and strum around on. There was no sense that, you know, yeah. 70 years time, they'd be heirlooms, you know. Um, oh, look, lovely, lovely bit of story on that. And I'm, you know, honoured that, you, that I, you know, we've all had a bit of a strum on it and it's yeah, lovely. It's a but good thing. It's, it's got a smell. Did you notice that? It's, it, There's it, something about, <laughs> maybe I'm just <laughs> weird, but uh, I love the smell of old guitars. And you open the case, the original case too. And it's got this history comes out in, in an aroma. It's amazing. It's, oh, it's amazing. Okay, so back on track here, because I know we've still got one or two, maybe more crazy level artists. So let's, Dire Straits, amazing, sessions, touring, crazy. That presumably comes to an end at some point or other and you, you, you move on to the next <laughs> thing. So you know, we must be... Where are we at now? Mid-90s. <laughs> Mid-90s now. Yeah, yeah, because the Straits finished in 92, 93. Right. And <clears throat> I, I, after that, I kind of wandered around the session circuit again for a while, but at, at a higher level because, you know, with a, with yeah. a pedigree like, you know, the Straits and Eric, you know, it was, um, 
in fact, it was it was a strange one because people suddenly say, "Well, he won't he won't want to do my session," and, and I really did, you know, or it would be too expensive for me yeah. now, you know. So that all went on, but you know, I, I managed to persuade people that I wasn't gonna <laughs> wasn't gonna cost too much, and I was willing to do it. So, so I, I went back into the session circuit, and we did some great stuff, you know. And we did a lot of um, house band things, and big charity events at that mm -hmm. point, um, you know, with people like Pino and uh, Phil Collins, and you know, it was a it was a house band kind mm -hmm. of thing, and we did some very interesting events in that format. Including the the show for Montserrat. Uh, I've seen that as well on it. That was a big, um, it was massive. Didn't George Robert Martin, Hall. yeah, um, organise that? Or yeah, that did, was his yeah. thing, wasn't it? Was it was his thing, yeah. And again, and he, everyone was at that, weren't they? Everyone. Was that on Montserrat? No, it was at Albert Hall. Right. Okay. Because I I, 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 I remember going to Montserrat on a day trip when we were in the Caribbean with my wife you know just as a, and thinking to myself it's mad to think that there'd be a, there's a studio on this island somewhere because it's a tiny tiny island isn't mm. it so right so there was a big that's right because it was the it was the volcano wasn't it that's Montserrat right. to raise money for the of course that's right <laughs> I'm trying to remember so that was a crazy big gig wasn't it it was a fabulous gig and it was I think maybe the first time I worked with Paul McCartney and the, we did a Beatles medley of that, four, four or five songs, one of which was Hey Jude. And there was a point when I'm strumming guitar in Hey Jude, which is an F, I think, <coughs> and Paul McCartney's singing it, and I'm thinking, this is bizarre. It's, it's up there, right? Yeah. It's just, uh, do you have grandchildren to tell these stories to? I have a, a young granddaughter, yes, yeah, she's two. Oh. Uh, I hope she appreciates it when she gets a bit older and just, she, uh, she thinks she's got the probably coolest granddad of them all. Um, That's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, you know, for, right. for that. That's amazing. So, I mean, I've got, you know, some of the biggest, you, you mentioned, uh, well, I say you didn't mention because you're so too modest to mention anything. I read somewhere uh, that uh, did some George Michael stuff. Oh, yeah, George, yeah. I mean, doesn't, again, a bit of a, not necessarily the same audience as, as Dire Straits, but it's, you know, arguably the, you know, one of the greatest male singers of all time. And, you know, certainly in his peak, didn't come any bigger than that. So. No, it's true, he didn't. I, uh, my first job with, with George was uh, for an album called Listen Without Prejudice, mm -hmm. which was the album After Faith. Mm -hmm after the album that Faith was on anyway. And it was his first pr proper solo album. Um, <clears throat> and it was quite a weird project because it was stage one of, of, an, of an album. So basically George had ideas for songs uh, rather than you know, organized parts and stuff. So I would get called in to strum, uh, to find a pattern to strum to uh, with some chords that he kind of evolved over the space of, a, of an evening and uh, it would be me and, an, and a click track or even a drum machine sometimes just you know the, the initial stages of, of songs and um, him and Chris Porter would uh, take it away for a few days and, and develop it and edit it and you know develop it into a song structure and then I would come back and play it again in the structure that they've organised, so, mm -hmm. but it was it was always me alone mm. on the original tracks of, of a lot of those things. I mean, tracks like Freedom Ninety. You know. Yeah, what was again? I've I, w I certainly remember Faith coming out, and I was still probably just finishing school, and then Listen Without Prejudice came out, and if I remember rightly, that was he'd he'd come out, and he was like, "Take me as I am." You know, and he was, it was quite a... Oh, he didn't the, come out officially. Did he not? I no, thought, and, what was, until, it, was it the next one then? There was there was a point at which yeah. he sort of went from going, I'm going to be the careless whisper guy to I'm going to be the, this, I'm going to be this much more opinionated person. And, you know, okay, but I just, maybe, but I was one, you know, get really complicated character by the sounds of things, you know, yeah, and obviously yeah. a pretty tragic ending. Yeah, totally. Um, but what was he like as a, as a person to work with? He was the boss, you know. He didn't, never crossed the line into friendship. I didn't. Right, OK. I don't think anybody really did. I was talking to his engineer of 30 years, a guy called Niall, yesterday. 
because they're putting together uh, all the tracks, they're re recording, the re uh, remixing the mm -hmm. tracks and remastering them. Um, and you know, he felt the same way as I did. You know, you never cross that line. I mean, if George invited you to his house, then you would go, but you know, because it was socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. But you'd never cross the line into being a friend. I mean, there's only one guy that I can ever remember that was able to cross that line, and that's Danny Cummings, the percussionist. Mm -hmm. And he had a great relationship with George, and they had, you know, Danny could take the piss out of George mm -hmm. and get away with it, you know, because he would make, make George laugh. Mm -hmm. But he's one of the few people that could. So it, it was not, a, I wouldn't say it was a friend, mm -hmm. although we did work together for 30 years. Did you, w so you must have been in the, you know, were you in, in sessions where he would sing and you were, so I mean, was that, because I just think he's an unbelievable vocalist, you know, just, was that spine tingly kind of stuff or, or are you just, just another, it was another person thing, that you worked with? Yeah. I mean, he was, he would fix a lot of stuff afterwards. I mean, like we all did. Yeah. Right. And track things up to make them sound great and stuff. And it was interesting dissecting the tracks yesterday and listening to the backing vocals on Faith, for example, mm. which are just a big block of him. Right. You know, maybe it's 12 tracks of different voicings and uh, different takes. And it was it's a fascinating process, but he was, he was meticulous about how mm. he did things, but uh, not always brilliant, honestly. Nice. Not always. Well, I suppose it's... He was human. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose the end product, I can't, I just... You know, I remember him singing at that Freddie Mercury tribute concert and oh, the stuff amazing. with Aretha Franklin and stuff. And I'm guessing that's not fixed. That's just no, that that's is, not fixed. And it's just he was very proud of that moment. gravy. You know, and very proud of that moment when he sang the the, the Queen song. Mm. We had to hold the long note at the end. Yeah, well, come on, Anderson, think what it is. Some, somebody to love. Somebody to love. Yeah. Yeah. Mental. He was very mm. proud of that moment because he was in himself <laughs> before that show. <laughs> He said, oh, this is a high note, it's right at the top of my range and I've got to really yeah. hold it. And he did it, and he did it great. You know, it's um, all power were you, to him. Really. Were, you, were you on stage for that show as no, well? I, wasn't there. <laughs> I was waiting for that one, thinking. No, I wasn't there for that one. <laughs> yeah. That was the one that you didn't do, was it? Okay, fair enough. So, uh, you know, and again, so career wise, then, are you, did, it, did, it, did you keep working with kind of powerhouse? acts like that through into the 90s and into the noughties or has there been a sort of a sense of you know taking it you know taking it a little step backwards and going right slow slow the pace down a little not bit not deliberately or? no um, <laughs> the, the record industry changed during the 90s and um, that's when I first started working with Trevor Horn mm -hmm. um, and we developed a, a, a nice understanding Trevor Horn is an interesting guy because he came from uh, the same roots as I did. He was a, a session bass player right. before he became you know, a, a successful producer, whatever. And he's, he still plays bass. Um, so we had a, quite a lot in common. But you know, his approach to recording was uh, quite different to what everyone else was doing. I mean, people, I uh, saw a quote the other day that Trevor Horn invented the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, in a way, it's probably true because he was doing great stuff with Seal yeah. and Grace Jones and all that stuff. I mean, Slave to the Rhythm, what a track that is. And, yeah, I mean, and, and, and work, he deserves some sort of MBE just for working with Grace Jones, doesn't he? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was not an easy lady. Um, but, you know, great records, great yes. ideas and fabulous sounds and stuff. Mm. But, and, but it, you know, the, the industry was changing. We were, you know, we'd gone from analogue to to digital so everything was edited in a different way and uh, you know suddenly all these possibilities became available to record producers and musicians that it didn't have before mm. you know before and uh, before uh, digital it was a razor blade and a <laughs> on a piece of tape you know that's what editing was back then so yeah the editing became easier the sampling started to happen the uh, the midi started to happen all that stuff was suddenly mm. revolutionized um the music industry the, the lin drum appeared and um yeah. drums started going out of business and uh, losing gigs and then suddenly uh, there was an extra person on recording sessions called a programmer you know uh, yeah, what does a programmer do you know, initially we thought 
Okay, but it was uh, just a guy who was there to, who could put the track together on a computer and you'd play to it. You'd, you'd play to a template often mm -hmm. during that period. And, um, you know, the, the producer or the artist or the, the uh, programmer would put a template together of the entire track with a, a guide bass and a guide drum kit and, and sometimes a guide guitar guy piano you know and then they would get musicians in to play mm -hmm. and that's how it started that was the gradual decline of, of of the session circuit do you think that um there was a period of time where just the guitar became marginalized as well in music and just therefore there wasn't the opportunity or it was the most difficult thing to synthesize i mean mm. you could get a, a, a believable piano sound and, yeah. and a eventually a good bass sound from a, from a machine. Um, but guitars were always a little bit more complicated to, mm. you know, there's so many variants inside the sound of an acoustic guitar, for example. And they didn't get that right for a long time. I think they probably have now. So what, what was that? I mean, were you comfortable in the sense of, did you feel like, you know, you'd built up your PPL kind of royalties and you'd, you know, you'd, you'd obviously from an ambition point of view, you know, there wasn't many things left to sort of tick, you know, that you hadn't done. Was it quite a comfortable sense of going, look, you know, it's fine if my career's gonna go in a different direction, now I'm I'm cool with that, or was it was it was it more It's uh, a gradual process, it was probably over ten, right. fifteen years. Oh, so okay. It didn't happen overnight. It's, it was a very gradual thing. But during those those years working with Trevor, I was often the token human. <laughs> On, on, on sessions, you know, to someone to come in to mess it up a bit because it was too too polite or too correct or you mm. know, without a groove or whatever. And I did a lot of sessions in that period. Yeah. Who were you working with? I mean, what, I mean, I can think of a few massive bands that you know Trevor produced, but who were you involved with? I did the Pet Shop Boys, right? Um, which I loved. They're great, those two. Yeah. Neil, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I did with Trevor, we did uh, Lisa Stansfield, we did... Lots of, it's a, they're all, not maybe not so much the Pet Shop Boys, but was, it, was there a sense there was, it never quite got like that sort of um, Stock Aitken Waterman kind of thing, but there was, there was definitely, they all had like a, a produced pop sound. Um, and was that, you know, I can't, I can't think of one of those bands where you go, yeah, that had that that had that guitar riff in it that you can, you know, that that hook that was recognised. They were all guitars as much more of a just a yeah. fill out fill out the background a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's pretty true actually. That's, that's uh, pretty but, accurate. But did it? I mean, are you? I mean, you 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 come across as as you know. At the end of the day, if you want me to do a session where you turn me right down in the mix versus a session where I'm front and centre, you don't care. It's just, it's just do what you do what you get paid to do. Uh, yeah, it's my job. Um, working with George was often like that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say it was a, <clears throat> a rewarding musical experience working with George Michael, you know, apart from him, you know, mm -hmm. he was, he was the, he was the whole thing. But if, it, if I did anything on a George Michael session too intricate or too <clears throat> important, he would say, don't do it. Right, because um, it's distracting from my voice, and he was very honest about it, and he was probably very right too at the same time. But don't do anything too distracting. Just play the part, and uh, don't be don't be clever, because I don't want to be overshadowed in any way. It's, yeah, look, it's his prerogative, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure he's not the only singer that's attained that level of success, and 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 worked the musicians like that as well well what so where bring us up to speed then you know what i know you live in italy now and and have done for 10, ten years, years or so yeah. yeah um what what you know are you you know have you tried to write some of your own stuff and get that out of your oh, system yes. and yes, sort of you know what's that's the... been happening although i've i haven't committed to a solo album yet right um i've always avoided that i don't want really to do that you know it's it's for people like Jeff Beck or, you know, it's, uh, they're the ones that do solo albums. I'm not, I'm not known enough, really, I don't think. But, um... Would it be an, would it be an instrumental album or I can don't you sing know. a little bit? I, I do sing now. Mm -hmm. I do sing. It's something that I've uh, developed over the last few years. 
because um, you know you have to reinvent yourself during these periods of change. You know, you can't just hope that it's all going to come back again because it won't. So uh, I, I started writing a lot and um, in production as well. And I did a lot of that in Italy, and I worked. Um, uh, a lot with a guy called Renato Zero, um, who's probably the Italian Elton John, right? At that kind of level, yeah, yeah. Very important artist in Italy. And we did um, over the last few years, we've done two albums, and I've written sixteen or seventeen of the songs. So, you know, I've reinvented myself yeah. as a writer. And during the process of, of demoing all those songs, I sang, mm -hmm. and I, I started to quite enjoy it. Yeah. So, who knows? Well, I, honestly, I, I, you, tell us about the book. Come on, because it, 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 I feel, I feel like, you know, we've we've only met today. I, f I feel like you're the, you know, you're the sort of person I could spend, you know, I could meet over and over and over again and still enjoy hearing stories and stuff. And and there's just no, there's no ego with you at all. Uh, you know, which is lovely in this, and then sometimes you sort of you sit there going, you know, do you put, you don't, you don't sell yourself at all, really. I don't think so. But it, t tell us about the book because I, I kind of feel was this a, you know, you, you mentioned um, got two year old granddaughter, and some of it was about getting it down so that you know perhaps you know she'll be able to know yeah, a little bit and more my about kids, her. my own kids, you know, we're both in their thirties now. Are you as modest with them as you have been? You know, are they are they going to be hearing they, stuff they in this interview take, going? They used to take the that. piss out of me for what, what I did for a living yeah, oh. when they were kids. They did. Because, you know, I'm prone, when I'm playing a solo song, I might pull a face. They say, what are you doing that for, Daddy? You know, stuff like that, as you do. Musicians pull faces. Um, so, and I think once when they were at school, um, they started to understand that what I did for a living was actually quite cool. Mm. Because from their friends, you know, they just, it was my job and I, I disappeared for months on end while they were growing up and they, I think they resented music because of that in a way. But um, no, they started to understand that, you know, where I'd been and what I'd done was, was quite important. So they were part of the, uh, the, the incentive to write the book. Apart from, as described in the book, I had a very strange moment. I was on tour in Brazil with a guy called Eros Ramazzotti, who's an Italian artist. And it was a, a pretty intense uh, few days. And we'd arrived back at the hotel in Sao Paulo at uh, 3 a.m. And we had to leave again at 5 to get a plane to go somewhere else. So I just um, basically I laid on the bed with all my clothes. I brushed my teeth, laid, packed my bag, and laid on the bed with my clothes, and waited for the phone to, to ring or the alarm to go off. And I went into this weird trance, and I, I never happened since. And um, it was a very strange kind of moment. It was a, it was like having a, a video machine with my life on it and a, a remote control. And I was able to fast forward and pause and go back and, you know. And it just this intense uh, amount of information was <laughs> flooding into my me memories of things I'd long forgotten. Memories of my child when I was four, childhood. Uh, early music in in inspiration and stuff like that. And uh, I was woken up out of this kind of weird trance and all this stuff is going on. And I thought, I've got to start writing this down. So I picked up the phone and... I started working on on the phone, you know. At the same time, I, it was like a <clears throat> a weird premonition because you know, if you see your life flashing before you, you <laughs> think maybe something bad's going to happen any minute, you know. And we had a flight in South America, and blah blah blah. And the weather wasn't good, and I thought, I thought, oh God, what's going on? But it was like that. It was my life was flashing before me, and I managed to you know write a lot of it down the key moments on my phone uh, over the next few days and then I transferred everything to computer and then it's it was a weird thing because as you open one door into a memory there's other doors inside the memory and you keep going inside it and um, it, it became a book well I will put a link to where you can buy this below um, I think you can get it as obviously as a regular printed copy or as an ebook but I'll put yeah. links below where you can get that it's 
honestly, it almost feels a shame to sort of go, you know, and that's a wrap kind of thing because it, it's. I, I bet you, we're going to go and have uh, some lunch after this in I in the so. pub, uh, and I bet you, you go, oh, of course. And then there was this time that I worked with massive artist named, and I completely oh, we, forgot to tell forgotten, you about that time. Forgotten about Robbie Williams and take that. I mean, that's what I was doing in the nineties. Yeah, well, I mean, that was just small, wasn't it? And no wonder you forgot about it. I mean, hey, you know what? I'm going to leave it there. You're going to have to buy the book if you want to find out about that. Or you're going to have to come back and do part two. <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> but look, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for coming in. It's, right, it's it? honestly been an absolute pleasure. It's half as much fun just watching Pete's face and Oz's face behind the camera as all mm -hmm. the, the stories are coming out. But I hope you've enjoyed it. I know it's been a long one, this one, but, um, you know, it is what it is. I hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you so much, Phil. It's been My an absolute pleasure. pleasure. See you all um, again. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you guys. Bye-bye.